WGPR Detroit HD2. You're watching WHPS, Highland Park, Detroit. The views and opinions expressed on the following show are not necessarily the views and opinions of WHPS, its affiliates, management, or sponsors. You wouldn't have to go anywhere because this is the Talk Beat Jones. <laughs> Welcome to the Billy E. Jones Talk Beat Jones Show. I hope everyone is well today, and I am Michelle Broton here with you, family. Hope today is a wonderful, wonderful day. We have a, a beautiful show ready for you to share with you, and I just hope everyone is well. Again, we are here. Today is a wonderful day. It's a rainy day. It's a rainy day, but it's a wonderful day. So what we would like to share with you, I just have a little caveat. Once again, we have lost a giant. We have lost another living library. And I am speaking of the Honorable Adam Shakur. He made his transition on Monday. Also, he was somebody near and dear to me as well. The whole entire city, the older people, the young people might not know so much unless they are doing their research. He was a lawyer for the Honorable uh, Coleman Young, Alexander Coleman Young. He was the, um, the mayor uh, assistant. Uh, deputy mayor, that's what it is. He's a deputy mayor. And he came around to the Detroit Public Schools mentoring children, helping children, telling them why not to get into trouble. And he was just, just a giant. And he loved his people. And he made history. And he made it better, tried to make it better for those that came behind him. So we are going to see probably his last interview before he went on to the next phase. And so we want to share that with you. And again, family, we are still trying to make sure that you pay attention, you take care of your business, because we want to make sure that you stay in your homes. So far as the city of Detroit is concerned, we are still doing clinics for everyone that needs it and the next clinic will be held at the Refford Library on Grand River where the Six Mile and Grand River across the street from the Myers grocery store will um, um, that's the area where we'll be in on Friday from 1030 to 230 so you might want to take advantage of that because if you get one of these things on your door you might want to pay attention and call any of those numbers because it's very, very valuable that you get the help that you need to stay in your palace, in your home, in the place that you love the most. Also, I did find out for renters, they have the best opportunity because if the homeowner doesn't want to pay the taxes on the house and he loses it to foreclosure, you're sitting in the best spot. You can apply to have that home and go through the process. And if you love that home, you love that neighborhood, you want to stay there, now you become the home owner. And so this is what we are trying to accomplish as far as making it better, making it greater for Detroiters, for the original Detroiters to stay in their homes, to stay in their neighborhoods, and become the best that they could possibly be. 
So now we are going to, in a few minutes, share with you a video of the Honorable Adam Shakur. The WHPR, WHPS special. Have some wonderful, great guests tonight. And uh, let me just bring on my guests. Let me take the glasses off. I am Billy E. Jones, and make sure that you tell your friends right now to tune in to WHPR, WHPS, around the world, the Roku Box, and all of the live uh, spearing uh, devices that's going to show you everything all around the world. But I want to go directly to my guests, if I can do that, please. I am so fortunate to be here today with some great, great, great individuals, people that we want to shine and give them the spotlight. Judge Shakua. Yes, sir. The living legend. How are you today? I'm just blessed and feeling very good. And we also have the Attorney General from Minnesota, Mr. Here. Keith Ellison. That's me. Mr. Ellison, we'll come up to the microphone there. Sure, thank you. For and, uh, having us. Yes, and uh, I know that you are special, but the living legend here today is uh, Judge Shakur. Absolutely. Before we get started, uh, Attorney General Ellison, would you give us some thoughts about your feelings about the judge? Well, first of all, uh, I was born and raised in the city of Detroit. I'm very proud of that. I was uh, born to uh, a family that cared a lot about justice, cared a lot about fairness. So I was naturally inclined to be uh, grateful to anybody who stuck their neck out for the benefit of the community. And uh, certainly Judge Shakur did that. I'm from a multi-religious faith community. Family. Yes. My mom it was, a very, was a devoted member of Jesu Catholic Church. My brother's a Baptist minister, <laughs> and I converted to Islam, reverted to Islam when mm -hmm. I was 19 years old, and I just turned 58 a few days ago. Okay. So I've been a Muslim for a long time. Did you say you reverted at yeah. 19, so you had been a Muslim, moved away from it, and no. got back in? No. I, well, you know, we, we, in Islam, we believe that our nature is obedience to God. Got it. And so that's all I really mean. Yes. I, I went to that. Yes. You know? And, and so, no, I grew up in a Catholic household, and, uh, but my family and I, we, we love each other. We get along great. And the, and the biggest repercussion of me becoming a Muslim is that my brother said, does that mean I get his portion of ham now? <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, you can have it all, bro. <laughs> my mom said, well, we're going to put uh, turkey in the greens now. So that was it. But, but Adam Chikor, you know, uh, was uh, one of the people who inspired me to to investigate Islam and learn about it and, be and become a Muslim where right down the street uh, at Davidson uh, at the Muslim Center and uh, Davidson and Rosa Parks Boulevard is where I got active as a Muslim and uh, became a, a Muslim at that place and and all everybody there was uh, tremendously grateful and admired Judge Shakur for his his work and his commitment his fearlessness and so it's very natural for me and quite an honor for me to be able to come to from Minnesota to to uh, um, Detroit, my hometown, to uh, join with people who appreciate him in uh, celebrating his his 74th birthday. His 74th birthday. Yeah, and uh, it's a, it's a blessing to have a 74th birthday. And as somebody who's done so much with those 74 years, yes, Judge Shakur has not wasted his 74 years. He has made the maximum and really is an example of a life well lived. So uh, that's what I'm doing here. Some folks may know I was the first Muslim in Congress. Yes. But he was the first Muslim judge in the United States. In the United States. And uh, so before the, Keith Ellison ever put his hand on the Quran to be sworn into Congress, which I did do, it was Thomas Jefferson's Quran, by the way. Okay. Um, Why he, Thomas Jefferson? Well, because... Uh, I had a lot of haters, brother, mm. and who were saying that you know you're not. It's not okay to be a Muslim, and that all y'all are terrorists and all this stuff. And so I said, well, wait a minute. If if Thomas Jefferson had a Quran, which he used in helping him inform him in writing the Declaration of Independence and everything else, then you know that's sort of like that. That's an all-American Quran, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> okay. And it kind of stopped the, a lot of the a lot of the detractors because they were trying to other 
me and they've been trying to other us is that right judge That's correct and yes. trying to push us out of the american mainstream whereas islam's been in the united states forever about a third of the people who were kidnapped in africa and dragged here uh had islam is their religion which was going to be the question that i guess i could ask both of you uh being in the muslim faith how has that impacted your political reach well judge? um if i may um uh, let me also say, uh, like my brother uh, uh, Keith Ellison, I am a product of a family. And my mother, um, so it's kind of ecumenical, uh, my mother was uh, uh, a member of the uh, United Methodist Church. Okay. Uh, my father uh, was the son of a Baptist minister and the grandson of a Baptist minister. And uh, he was a Baptist. So I had a, a, a great chance to uh, be brought up in a God-fearing and loving home. Mm -hmm. In fact, every Sunday, uh, we said a uh, Bible verse uh, before we uh, had our, uh, our meal. And of course, for many of my younger years, my famous uh, uh, quote, was Jesus wept. Jesus my wept. said, you got to learn some more Bible verses. <laughs> and uh, of point. course, <laughs> uh, I had the exposure uh, to the Roman Catholic faith uh, in my uh, education. Mm -hmm. And I uh, went to a school that no longer exists in, uh, in Detroit, but historically uh, was in the Black Bottom, uh, St. Joe's, mm -hmm. which was an all-boys um, uh, Christian uh, a Catholic uh, uh, school, and they had a, a model saying, builders of boys and makers of men. Yes. And they did a, a great job. They were the founding uh, entity for De La Salle and Brother Rice, and, mm. and uh, they, uh, I'll tell you an example. When I was a freshman, the principal called me in, and uh, he then said, uh, Adam, I want you to go to the bank. And the brothers had just gotten their tuition payments. And he stuffed in my side about $2,500. The neighborhood That's big money. was very much in a change atmosphere. And the bank was uh, right over um, by uh, Werner and, uh, and Russell Street off of, uh, as Werner ran into uh, Gratiot. And uh, he said, put this in, don't talk to anybody. And of course, I did it and uh, gave him the receipt uh, when I came back. I, I, I was blessed to be trustworthy of that um, uh, largesse of, of cash um, just as a 14-year-old. And so from my vantage point, all religions have a similar concept, the fatherhood of God mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the brotherhood of mankind. Mm -hmm. And as a concept, uh, it was very easy for me after I studied Islam and studied my history of my ancestors, knowing full well that my great-grandfather, who was from Cameroon, West Africa, was a Muslim. Mm. And it had lasted uh, that length of time, so I wasn't antagonistic to anyone of any faith. Yes. And of course, uh, I converted to Islam uh, from, uh, I would say, I went to the Baptist church more than I went to the Methodist church, and I converted uh, uh, at the age of uh, 22. Mm. So, okay. uh, for me, all religions are a model for us to follow, but there's only one God. Mm -hmm. And as a concept, I was more familiar and comfortable with the religion of Islam because it answered my questions that I had um, over the course of my life. But as a concept, Unfortunately, America has a disdain. It separates people. It 
creates conflict where there is none. Mm. And so as mm. a young Muslim in school with various other faiths uh, and a misunderstanding that many of them had about Islam, it was, uh, shall we say, points for harassment and points for um, not um, uh, getting what I was entitled to receive. Yes. Uh, and I ran into discrimination. Thank you. Thank both you. as a black man. Thank you. And as a Muslim. Come on now. Come on. So my uh, uh, effort is always been, I was taught by my parents, that when there is an injustice perpetrated against you, uh, you don't cave in. You fight it and correct it. Judge, is that, uh, you know, when you came out of school, college, you had the opportunity to go in many different directions. You chose to be an attorney. Yes. Is that what fired you up to, and, and you fought for the people? Yes. So is that where your activism started, or when did your activism start? No, it actually started, I was about 17, uh, and that was the uh, about 1964. Uh, a lot of activities were going on in Detroit, and I uh, became a member of the uh, NAACP youth uh, program. And so my activism uh, really uh, began with uh, a light that uh, I received by way of uh, those actions of uh, those adults, seven, eight, ten years my senior. And I got involved in carrying signs. And at that time, uh, there was discrimination at the dime store, mm -hmm, five and mm -hmm, 10. Mm -hmm. uh, today's uh, uh, population may know it more as a Target or you know, some uh, other kind of um, a multi-service uh, uh, business. But um, I became active uh, at 17. And uh, as I went to college, I became active uh, with the uh, anti-Vietnam War movement. Mm. I became active with the workers' rights movement. Mm. And uh, I had worked at uh, Ford's uh, Rude Stamping. And I saw the discrimination. I saw uh, the maltreatment, uh, mm. the lack of uh, proper uh, pay for various work. For instance, I was a heavy press operator and I saw where they would tell me, well, you gotta do more, you gotta do more. And then a senior worker may say, no, they're running jab on you, Adam. You've already beaten their production on this machine, it's 700. And I was loading off 800, 1200. Wow. See, all that guy is trying to do is to get you to help him make more as a bonus for his supervision over you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as a mm -hmm. matter of growth, um, I attribute my activism uh, to those persons, the UAW, uh, mm -hmm. Local 600, and uh, uh, another organization that I became a part of, the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, General Baker, um, mm -hmm. was a a, a mentor of mine, yes. a fellow named John Watson, Luke Tripp, and uh, Kenny Cockrell Sr. And uh, so um, I was in the movement, I guess from age 17 uh, through. And uh, of course, um, they were stalwarts that I still admire. Some of them are no longer with us, uh, but the movement still goes on. And I appreciate uh, you getting into you know, my beginnings. Yes, yes. Now, um, before I go to the Attorney General, one question further is that, what was your experience like being the Chief Judge at 36 D District Court? It was an um, uh, interesting uh, experience, and uh, I had, uh, the 36 District Court is the largest uh, district court of its kind uh, in America that was housed under one roof. Wow. We annually processed about 500,000 uh, cases. And that goes from everything from traffic uh, uh, tickets uh, uh, to um, um, various uh, civil and uh, criminal uh, lawsuits. Uh, and uh, it's a very, very uh, busy operation. I originally became a Wayne County Common Pleas Court judge 
and they were merged with a legislative act, merging. Um, can you tell us? They can you, can you say what you were before one one more time? I couldn't quite catch that. Wayne County Common Pleas Court. What is that? That was a civil, all civil court. Okay. And we handled <clears throat> landlord tenant cases for Wayne County, and we handled civil suits for Wayne County that was less than the jurisdictional amount that circuit courts handled at that time, it was $10,000. Okay. But we often served as visiting circuit court judges, and many of our uh, decisions would go into the hundreds of thousands of dollars because we had jury trials, and of course, uh, that uh, jury would determine uh, what the uh, uh, damages were in a particular uh, civil lawsuit. And we thought, those of us, the 12 or 13 of us that were judges at that time in that court, we thought that when the court decided to merge, that we would merge with Wayne Circuit. But the politics of the era, and I think some miscalculations of our then chief judge, uh, he outmaneuvered us politically, okay. uh, brought about recorder's court, which was a criminal and traffic court uh, that received that designation. But many of them are my friends, so I wouldn't want to, <laughs> uh, you know, bring up uh, bad memories. Yes. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that was um, how it became and how the court evolved into the 36th District Court. Two more questions, just two more questions. One is... Your experience while you served with uh, the Honorable Coleman Young. Yes. What was it like? It was a beautiful experience. Um, I, I met Coleman Young in my struggles in union activism, and uh, he and I always got along together. He was uh, a native of uh, Alabama, as was my father. And uh, many of the uh, uh, times that I was involved in various activist movements, stop robberies, and Joy say street mm -hmm. stress. Mm -hmm. Yes, stress, and, yes. Uh, we were opposed to that and marched in that. Uh, uh, Mayor Young, when he was Senator Young, would often encourage us. Uh, we got involved with the TULC, the Trade Union Leadership Conference, Buddy Battle, and many other of the stalwarts of that era, uh, Murray Jackson, uh, uh, senior and you know many 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 other uh, great men in the labor movement and in the political movement and um, so when I became a judge he um, definitely uh, uh, was very proud of that fact and told me so uh, but uh, shortly thereafter he was asking, man, when you go come over here and help me out? <laughs> and I said, man, I got to invest my pension, my family. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, I became chief judge, uh, and um, uh, I wanted to reshape some of the things that the court did uh, to make it more people-sensitive. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I could set up structures and uh, create uh, opportunities for uh, various courts uh, to be more service-oriented. Uh, toward its uh, its uh, city of Detroit uh, residents, and I I I really uh, love the job, but at the point in time that a lot of drug activity was affecting yes, Detroit. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Coleman then asked me, um, and he doesn't like to hear no, but I, he asked me to come over and help him. And Coleman didn't do too many things, say, help me or I need. That wasn't his, his, uh, his language. Mm -hmm. uh, so I s knew that he needed some assistance. And uh, so I said, man, let's, let me vest my pension. I had a few months left, and I decided, uh, when I did, that I would retire. Yes. So my family is protected. Mm -hmm. My first obligation was to their preservation of their uh, survival mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, and I um, I uh, took him up on his offer and he appointed me um, a position that had been vacant for about 10 years as his uh, deputy mayor and chief administrative officer mm -hmm. and handed over the reins of uh, uh, basically uh, drug enforcement and 
drug development into other uh, capacities to help these young men who found themselves victims of crack and other uh, drug uh, um, drugs impacting their lives and their families' lives. Yes, Judge. The, the last question I have is about the MOTEP. Can you explain what is MOTEP and what is it about? What is the purpose? What is the journey for MOTEP? MOTEP is an organization that I became affiliated with in the last four years. I myself have been um, uh, made more aware. Uh, I was made originally aware of people donating organs for my mother. Uh, I was 18 and she had signed uh, with the uh, license uh, to have the license identify her as an organ donor when she passes and she took me aside and she said well uh, honey I know um, when I uh, leave here mm -hmm. I, I want you to know that I want my organs donated to help some things uh, in our society and help other people uh, my mother was a science uh, a teacher of, of, of note at uh, Durfee Middle School mm -hmm. Junior High developed a program called Swam Dwipes, which became a forerunner to DAPS. Swam? Swam Dwipes, study understandings, analysis, uh, materials, Dwipes. It was teaching the scientific method. Yes. And she was able to get many of the junior high school students into winning science fairs. Mm -hmm. One group said, no, these kids didn't do that. And we want to have them reevaluated. And uh, she said, fine, go right ahead. And they reevaluated and said, well, these kids are phenomenal. <laughs> uh, and she was a, a teacher uh, who learned her craft in West Virginia. And uh, she was a coal miner's daughter. And of course, she was the first one to go to college uh, from the family. And um, so, uh, Kenneth Hill, who started DAPSEP, uh, con conversed with her, and he brought her program. In fact, the highest award uh, that DAPSEP uh, gives, if they're still giving it, was the Esther Cadell Award. My mother was Queen Esther, Esther Cadell. Hart Cadell. Yes. Wow. Durfee uh, Middle School. And, yes. Uh, yes. And that's that's my mom. That's wow. My mom. That wow. Wonderful. And uh, when she told me that, uh, and said, well. If uh, I don't live past your father, uh, then uh, you let him know, because uh, she had told him, uh, that you want to see this done. And of course, if I do die and, and my husband is deceased, uh, then you have the, my permission to uh, donate uh, you know, my organs. And so minorities are often the beneficiaries of larger populations, gifts of such things as mm. heart and liver and eye, uh, uh, cornea and kidneys, et cetera. But the gift of life yes. is, uh, is very important and, and, and creates a uh, legacy uh, of giving, which I think is a part of our responsibility as human beings. And we are given this gift of life by our almighty creator. However, we refer to him, her, because mm -hmm. uh, he is not containable in how we define uh, people. Uh, but it is that we are given this earth, we're giving all the foods, all the weather, everything that we need to survive. Yes. And yet, when that body, which is going to get a new body when yes. it goes to its rewards, um, has gifts to give to others. Uh, but one of my uh, uh, mentors told me that, why do you think God gives you two kidneys and you only need one? Mm. Okay. That's a lesson from the Almighty okay. that you must give. Come on, Jeff. And he gives you the capacity from your very birth. Yes. Mm. And, uh, makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. So <laughs> I said uh, that I would join with that cause. And uh, today, uh, with uh, Brother uh, Ellison's help and many of my friends and others, uh, we have raised over $15,000 wow. for MOTEP. 
fantastic. Uh, to spread the message and to get the word out for minorities. Listen, help your brother and your sister. If you come to that time, why allow it to be lost to the earth mm -hmm. when it could be gifts to the living? Yes, yes. And so I'm a big uh, a believer and what I believe in, I work towards. And MOTEP is the organization that I have uh, pledged my, uh, uh, my gifts to. And um, when I'm gone, I hope somebody is blessed with whatever parts I have that well, can assist them. Well, Judge Shakur, you have made a convert of me. Oh, thank you. I will be a person that will You're go. In? Yes, I'm in. I'm all right. in. I'm listening to you. I'm, I'm all the way in. And you have a thing about, um, you say that as long as God gives you what, sir? As long as God has given you life. Yes. Which you have earned nothing of. Yes. From that small congealed clot of blood. Mm -hmm. That you have hands, eyes, a brain. Yes. You build roads and highways. And you can't recognize that what you have received, you also have a responsibility of giving. My God. And that is uh, my, uh, my sense and my direction. And what I believe in, I practice and I promote. And I have uh, been blessed to have a, a pretty decent life. And so, um, you know, I have, uh, I have given and will continue to give and uh, hopefully uh, when my time comes, uh, whatever my body parts will allow, I uh, give those to others. You've taken my fear away. Seriously, you've taken my fear away and I'm sure that there are many other black folks who had fear about volunteering to be a transplant person. Yes. To have the organs tra donated. Um, with the thought that, well, maybe they may take me out here sooner so they can take my organ. I believe you. I believe you, and I'm sure that the folks out there are listening to you and have the greater understanding that this is what we should do. We should step up and help our fellow brothers and sisters and people, period. Yes, sir. With our organs. Thank you very much. We appreciate that, that you're doing all that you've done and all that you still continue to do. Still a practicing attorney. Thank you so <laughs> much. Yes, I still have to help. <laughs> that's my, you that's my case, task. Judge. Thank you. You made the case? Thank you. you okay, the he's the winner. <laughs> Attorney Keith Ellison, sir, you have a tremendous person that you've looked up to, I'm sure. Absolutely. I've sat here and watched you listen to him, and it's like watching someone is just being, oh, he's so all of that, and I just love him. <laughs> that was you. And I appreciate that, sir. That's love and that's respect. If you notice, Judge Shakura mentions his mentors all the time. Yes, sir. It's a good idea. If you want to be successful, watch somebody who's been successful, right? Yes, sir. So Judge Judge Shakur has people he looked to to sort of guide his his direction. And I look I'm smart enough to know that if I'm trying to be successful in this life, not just as a lawyer, not just as a of a, a citizen, but as but as a person, yes, you know, yes. I mean, we're here. Judge Shakur is telling us how to live a good life at the end of life, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you may not have anything earthly to give to anybody else other than your cornea, other than your marrow, other than your lungs. But you're going to give that because that's the kind of person he is. He gives, and uh, you know, he just keeps on teaching us and. We ought to be smart enough to keep on listening. I noticed, uh, Attorney General, that in your serving the people, that as a Muslim, I want to ask you, how, was, how did that affect your career moving forward? Well, you know, I, I, candidly, it, 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 it hurt sometimes and it helped others. Okay. You know, it helped me a lot because my faith helped me endure tough times. It helped me... Uh, uh, let fear drip away okay because when people are coming at you sometimes you get nervous you start thinking about oh my god i'm what is this person going to do to me what is that person going to do to me but when you think there's no god but god then you think i can't bow down to anyone 
or anything. It, not my ambition, not my, you know, I just, you just got to say. But you're the first. You're the first attorney general in Minnesota black. Well, I, I've been the first more than once, but you know what I've learned about what being is the first? It's better to be the best than to be the first. Come on now. Right? Come on. Uh, Jackie Robinson, he wasn't just the first black player in the Major League Baseball. He was Rookie of the Year. Okay. Saying he's the best. Right. And Adam Shakur wasn't just the first Muslim judge in America. He's, he's an, an excellent judge. He exceeded in terms of the quality of his service. Uh, and, and so my goal is not to be the first of anything. I've never gone into anything thinking, oh, I want to be the first. I go into it to serve, never without any thought to whether I'm first or not, right? Yes. So when I went to Congress, there had never been no Muslims in Congress before. Yes. And, you know, if you look at the wall of all the AGs in Minnesota, there's no black ones up there mm. except for me now. <laughs> but don't go into something to go be first because that means it's about you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go into it to serve. It may be your first or maybe you're not first, but maybe you'll be the best at serving the community whether or not you're a, uh, a, a broadcaster like yourself mm -hmm. or, or a judge like Judge Kaur, just, just put all you have in there and let the rest take care of itself. You know, while you were there, there are some very uh, significant things that you did while you were in Congress. Can you talk to, us, talk to us about that? Well, you know, I was in Congress for 12 years. And I tried to, I went in there with basically two goals. Yes. One is to try to make sure everybody could afford their life. And what does that mean? Well, if you can't afford your insulin, you can't afford your life. Got it. If you are being a victim of wage theft and you're supposed to get paid 15 bucks an hour and they're only paying you 11, then you can't afford your life. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you get sick and facing bankruptcy be, uh, because you got sick, even if you have insurance, you cannot afford your life. So I spent a lot of time on economic um, fairness and uh, fighting against economic predators like you know some of the payday lenders, some of the for-profit colleges, not all, some of them, some of the, uh, some of the uh, folks who are out there you know, charging exorbitant surprise fees. You go to the doctor, they say, oh, this is out of network, and therefore it's quadruple what you thought it was going to be yes and now you know so I, I spent a lot of time doing that i started the consumer justice caucus i started I, you know i uh, helped pass uh, and had bills in the con the credit card holders bill of rights one of the one of the uh, pieces of legislation that i'm proud to be part of is that before we pass my bill if you had three or four credit cards mm -hmm. and you were late on one of them the insurance, the, not insurance, the credit card company could go up on all of them. Okay. Now they can only go up on the, on the rate on the one you're late on, right? So if you have three credit cards and you go from 9 to 18% because you're late on one of them, the rest of them can say, oh, you're a risk, we want more money, which could put you in even more of an economic hole. And if you're praying, you know, so, so that's, and then, you know, so the credit card holders bill of rights was a big deal to be because so many people, you know, you know, are not making enough to afford their lives. So they use credit to try to pay for their lives. And it puts them in an economic downward spiral, particularly when you consider uh, inflation um, is far l lower than the increases in the price of it. education, student loan debt, health care and a bunch of other things and now housing. Yes. And so, you know, um, you know, w when I think of an economy, I think of a, 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 a social structure where uh, everybody should be able to be prosperous in the richest country in the world. Not more than three years ago, we passed a tax bill that cut the, it, the taxes on rich people of over a trillion dollars. Does, debt, does Jeff Bezos need more money? I mm -hmm. think he's doing good. He's doing pretty good. But Ms. McGillicuddy needs some help. Yes. And we say we're not going to help her, but we're going to help him. Mm. I think I'm not against rich people. I would like to be one of them one day. But I hope that if I was one of them, I would always have a heart for and a regard for the poor and would do everything I could to make sure that we had an economy in which everybody could hope to thrive. So that's a few of the things that we fought for the increase in the minimum wage. I was not successful there. 
and we have not seen an increase in minimum wage in over 12 years. Mm. You know? Okay. I also worked on and was able to pass some legislation to help people who were able, who were, um, who were in credit card, uh, not credit card, but, but were in uh, foreclosure. Mm -hmm. So you remember 2008, we had the big foreclosure crisis. Right. And a lot of people who lived in apartment buildings, they uh, would pay every pen penny of rent that they were supposed to. But if the landlord went into foreclosure, they could get kicked out that day. Yes. So I passed a, land, a, a bill that said that you, that you renters get 90 days no matter what happens to the landlord. Mm -hmm. And that was something that helped a lot of people stay in their homes. And so there was a lot of other things I worked on and did. But, uh, you know, we could talk about yeah. the Congressional Auto Trust con Caucus, yeah, yeah, the Congressional caucus. Consumer, uh, yeah, uh, Consumer Justice mm -hmm, Caucus, the Congressional uh, Progresses. Yeah, yeah, all those the Progressive Caucus, I was the co-chair of that. But let me just say about the Antitrust Caucus, if I may. Yes, please. As Attorney General, and I'm talking about right now, mm -hmm. I have been working hard to build up my attorney, my, my antitrust practice, increase our antitrust lawyers. I'm going to do this. Okay. I'm going to ask you, can you complete that in two minutes? Because in the I'll, last seven minutes, fast. I want to go through a, lit, lit, uh, a few questions here about Judge Lloyd. Yeah, and I, wanted, I want you to do that. But it, thank you for giving me just one second to talk about Listen. antitrust because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people listening to this show are like, well, what is Ellison talking about antitrust? What does that have to do with me? Well, you, why is your cable bill higher than it's supposed to be? Because there's only one or two companies that offer it. Mm -hmm. They can charge you whatever they want. Why is beef higher than it should be? Because there's only four companies that control 90% of the market. Why uh, is my pay stuck? You know, because if there's only one co company in the industry, they can pay you whatever you want. They want if mm -hmm. you want to stay in that industry. In fact, I sued Jimmy John's and, and some other companies because they had these non-compete clauses uh, for low-wage workers. Okay. So we sued them for mm -hmm. that. We're going to do that. Okay. And so we're trying to break up the companies that dominate the market, 90 80% of the market, because they stagnate wages and they charge higher prices. And that's not fair. And if you think that, and it stops innovation. So like you, and a lot of people think, well, what, how does this help black folks? Well, think about it. If they're hard on uh, white folks own small business, how are they on us? Think about a black company that might sell, say, hair care products, say hair grease. Well, if a big, co if a big giant company that controls 80% of the market wants to buy up that hair care company, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And now you don't own anything. We need antitrust enforcement and so we're going to do a lot of that it's racial justice it's worker justice it's small business justice it's innovation justice it's consumer justice it's all those things so thank you for giving me a chance. not a problem attorney uh keith ellison what was your thoughts when you were uh, viewing the video of george floyd's murder torture. murder Torture. Look, he was tortured for nine and a half As a half black days. man before, it, not necessarily as the attorney general, but as a black man looking at that, what was your thoughts? Well, I was horrified, you know? Microphone. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was horrified. I was horrified. I was not shocked. I, it was about 4 o'clock in the morning when I saw it. My staff sent it to me the night before. I leaned over to my wife and I said, honey, you got to see this. She said, I do not want to see that. I've seen too many people people of color, black people, brown people murdered. Uh, I don't want to see it. I said, I don't blame you, but I have to look at it. And I looked at it. And the thing that struck me is all those people who were screaming for Derek Chauvin to get off of George Floyd. Yes. To, to check his pulse. Yes. And just the inhumanity of just letting him die. And I noticed how he went from yelling, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Mama, 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 mama. Nothing. And it, it, it didn't trouble the conscience of Derek Chauvin or anybody else who was there who was supposed to care. Now, all the regular citizens were horrified. Yes. But those people who were trained, paid to protect and serve seem utterly callous to the plight of George Floyd. And I'm going to tell you right now, I know a lot of wonderful police officers. Yes, sir. I know some who I admire. I think they are wonderful service. But we've got to have a system where you know, the best officers can shine and the bad ones can get out of here. I mean, uh, we need to restore trust between community and policing. And when, and when I think of that nine-year-old girl who saw George Floyd murdered, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I fear that when she gets to be a 29-year-old woman, 
maybe a mom, she's going to tell her kids, don't trust the police. Well, she should be telling her kids, if you have a problem, go to the police first. But Derek Chauvin destroyed that trust. And that's not fair to every other person who wears a badge. And so so there you go, brother. I mean, um, that's how I felt as a black man. Now, we've seen or uh, we've uh, been able to view different circumstances similar, not that particular. But when you viewed that situation, was there anything that says we have to go in this uh, this case a little bit different? Well, yeah. So I didn't get the case right off. In every case in Minnesota, the original jurisdiction for a criminal act is under the, if it's a felony level case, is the county attorney. And only when the, pol the community lost confidence in the county attorney mm -hmm. uh, did the county attorney call me and say, look, man, this is not about me no more. Our city's burning. Will you help? I said, of course I'll help. Yes. How, how am I going to say no? And the governor said, we need you in there. So I'm like, I'm in. Yes. So when the coach says you're in, That's right. then you, you, then you the lace bench, up you read your play. sneakers mm -hmm. and you play. So we did. And I, but I knew that given that they had video in Rodney King and Yes, that went the I mean. wrong way. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, they had video in Walter Scott, who was killed in South Carolina, shot down. That went the wrong way. They had video in Laquan McDonald, and after and it took them four years in Chicago to charge anybody with that one. Um, I knew that we were uh, in a difficult. I knew that people thought it was easy because of the video. Mm -hmm. I knew it was extremely difficult. So we understood we had to have a solid medical case. We understood we had to have. Uh, it, would, it was great that Chief uh, Madeira Arredondo, black police chief, yes. said, this is not us. We do not condone this. It is wrong, and I will condemn it from the witness stand. I thought that that was a very critical part of the case. And then there were some lawyers who um, actually had uh, were not ordinary attorney general staff who I reached out to them and said, I need you to help out on this case. And, and they were. And so they combined with my staff, and they joined up, and we were able to. So civil, civil lawyers are used to put it on, are used to addressing complex medical cases. And you've been a civil lawyer. I have been a civil, civil rights lawyer, civil lawyer, and a criminal lawyer. But, and so I knew that in a case like this, we needed to have a pulmonologist. We needed to have a cardiologist. We needed to have a, uh, we needed to have a, a, a ER expert. And I knew who to get to help me put that together. So we, we did that. And, uh, you know, uh, thank God the outcome was that of guilty. But I, I didn't know it, we, the guy was going to be found guilty until the judge read the verdict for him. Mm, okay. uh, I, up to that moment, I thought, well, this could go either way. Listen, we got about 30 seconds, uh, Judge. Yes, sir. Would you like to say something real quickly? We have about, uh, about 30 seconds for you and about 30 seconds for you, if that's okay. Well, I'd like to thank you for such a outstanding, in-depth uh, um, presentation by uh, questioning us and I uh, appreciate it immensely and um, you know it's a it's a, a pleasure uh, for me to always come uh, with a um, black uh, radio television organization uh, that serves not only for informing uh, but also serves a significant role in educating uh, the community. And uh, I just want to applaud you and the other owners uh, of this uh, uh, television Watkins, radio. Mr. Henry Tyler, yes. Yes, sir, uh, for just, and keep on doing this great work that you do to educate us as a people. That's Mr. R.J. Watkins, Mr. Henry Tyler, sir. Mr. Attorney yeah, General. Yeah, brother, keep getting the word out. Knowledge is power which makes your job extremely important. Well, I'll tell you, my job is to ask, are you guys going to come back? Because Absolutely. this black station wants to see and hear and have our family have this information. We also want to have that backdrop. Our young folks who are out there doing what they're doing, they need to know about the history from your mouths. This is a presentation from the TV 33, WHPR, WHBS. Mr. R.J. Watkins, Mr. Henry Tyler, I am Billy Jones, and believe me, we love you. We appreciate you. Stay tuned. We have great, great programming. And to the Attorney General, Keith Ellison. Thank you. And, of course, to the living legend, Judge Shakur, thank you very much for coming to WHPR, WHBS. You. Appreciate you. Thank you. Family, love you. Bye. Ms. Michelle Broughton, this is the Talk Beat Jones. And 
Ms. Michelle Broughton, would you pick it up from there, please? As I was sharing with the family earlier at the top, we have lost a giant and a historian, a father, somebody that cared about you and everybody in the city of Detroit. And I'm talking about the Honorable Adam Secure. So I hope you enjoyed the information that we shared with you because it was really valuable. It was valuable to us. And it was such a refreshing reminder of everything that we have to go through to be successful. And he gave you his life history. So he started, but he ended up at the top. Um, and again, I'd like to also share that city council was for forward going, forward thinking, and we now also have a resolution in his name to honor him and his legacy. So young people, I would advise you to do your research, do your fact checking, because you have people that have a uh, champion to get you where you need it to be where you need to be, where you should be going, where you should be going. Where you should be going, Ms. Michelle Broughton. I also want to thank the Minnesota Attorney General, Mr. Keith Ellison, who is also the Muslim, and uh, he is mentored by the Honorable, who is that again? Adam Shakur. And uh, family, we have so much pride, and again, uh, we talk about the situation with George Floyd, and you, you watch the man himself, the Minnesota Attorney General, Mr. Keith Ellison. He is responsible for the, putting George Chauvin, Chauvin, whatever the guy's name is, behind bars. Michelle Broughton, let people know what we feel about our Muslim brothers from Detroit. Well, we love them. They also challenge or teach the youth or the ones that are on the street the lost the lost uh, little lambs how to come back in the fold and learn to first of all love yourself love your family and be a part of the community because you are scholars you are smart you are innovators. You are the next one to take us to the next plateau. If you're smart enough to hang out in the streets and do what you do, you know what you do. <laughs> you are smarter, should be smarter, to become the next, whatever that is. They use the word loosely, entrepreneur, but you are so much more than that. You're the next doctor. You're the next lawyer. You're the next mayor. You are the next, whatever that is. And to our Muslim brothers, you can see the brothers that have gone on to, be, to do great, great things. And we want to encourage you from folks from around the world. We truly love you. We truly appreciate you. And remember, this particular interview is so valuable because, of course, we want to let everyone know that um, the Honorable Adam Shakur uh, made his transition a few days ago and uh, we have the the interview that has never been shown that we want to make sure the world was able to see not only the Honorable Adam Shakur but also his student the Attorney General of Minnesota Mr. Keith Ellison back to you Miss Michelle Bolton okay so just remember, we have giants, and if they're still living, if you are able, you need to sit at their feet, learn as much as you can, so that we can take that forward and do better. So, again, I would like to remind my brothers and sisters who live in Detroit who own homes that might need some help, the Honorable Councilwoman at large, Mary Water, is here to service and to help you. She has her team out knocking doors to make sure that the homeowners are aware that this is going on so that you can come to the clinics and get the help that you need. And is, so what about this knocking on doors, walking, etc.? This is what's going on right now, Ms. Michelle Broughton? Yes. Yes, every day. 
So we're out there. I'm out there. You're out there. I know you. <laughs> Island tours. Mm -hmm. And if you answer, some of our homeowners are unaware or maybe forgotten that they were served and they were given a notice that their home is in foreclosures because of back taxes. So your treasurer, Wayne County Treasurer, mm -hmm. Eric Sabri, is allowing you, um, he extended the date until the end of this month, which is his date is March 30th to get some help fill out an application it looks like this they can't see it. okay well you're gonna fill out the application so that you can save your home you can stay in the home because that is your pot of gold that is your wealth and you want to stay in the home so your councilwoman is here to help you oh. to make sure that you're aware of that issue. All right. And family, we want to remind you that the Talk Beat Jones, we're on the air every Wednesday from 10 to 11. And also we want to remind you that Fake Friends, that's right, Fake Friends is on the air from 6 to 8 o'clock evening time on Wednesday evenings. That stars the star maker himself, Mr. R.J. Watkins, and uh, his star that he has just blown her up, Lawanda. The people that you see on that Lemon Burn commercial they're not fake. They're real. So you need to get that lemon bearing. But again, if you want to know who R.J. Watkins is, he is the owner. He is the mindset of WHPR, WHPS, along with his side hip, Mr. Henry Tyler. I am Billy E. Jones. And again, tune in on a Wednesday from 10 to 11 to see whom. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to see Michelle Broughton. And I'm Billy E. Jones. So continue to watch. The great program, which is WHPR, WHPS coming out of Detroit, Highland Park. See you very, very soon. Watch us and share this video. Bye now. You wouldn't have to go anywhere because this is the Talk Beat Jones. <laughs>